So what does a leading never-Trumper do now that this thing is fait accompli? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Professor Tom Nichols is one of the brighter minds in politics that I know, and he was one of the more aggressive and courageous guys on the Never Trump scene and took a beating on social media, but he knows how to dish it out as well. He and Donald Trump would actually uh, have quite the uh, Twitter war, should they ever engage, and I'm sure Donald will find him if he hasn't already sooner than later. But um, I'm really interested in, in getting Tom's perspective on where we go from here. He's recently written an article in the New York Daily News as to such. Uh, so let's get going on that. It's great to have you in. Thank you very much for tuning in. Let us uh, let us go to the rundown and see what's going on. Uh, guilty on 18 counts. Yeah, this is a shocker, uh, a real shocker for this guy. Maybe not a shocker for the rest of the world, however. Uh, Dan Doyle convicted, and Eyewitness News has the story. We find the defendant guilty, Your Honor. Dan Doyle heard the word guilty 216 times, each juror convicting him on all 18 charges against him. 216 times. He left the courthouse, still free on bail, saying nothing. His defense attorney, disappointed. How do you think? How would you take it? His whole life is shattered. It was a complicated case. Let there be no doubt about it. There were a lot of documents that had to be gone through tediously. And sometimes a case like this takes a long time to put together. Attorney General Peter Kilmartin praising his team and the jury for one of the longest trials in state history. When this trial started, it was 85 degrees out, and this morning it snowed. The investigation into Doyle began in 2012. Prosecutors said he was using his nonprofit, the Institute for International Sport, to pay for groceries, clothes, eye surgery, his daughter's tuition, and more. Plus, he forged nonprofit annual reports later filed with the government. Certainly, uh, Anybody that's running a nonprofit that thinks it's going to be their own personal piggy bank, um, this would be a lesson for them. Defense attorney Michael Blanchard says he stands by his argument that everything Doyle did was authorized, and he wants the public to know this about the man who founded that nonprofit for scholar athletes. Don't forget the good things he did. Mm. Well, you know, it's funny. In white collar crime, it seems like there's always a bunch of good things that the guilty person does. And let's also not forget that the state grant program is in the middle of this mess. It is uh, a loose diligence that allowed Dan Doyle to kind of do what he did with uh, a more than a half a million dollar state grant that first got the attention of uh, state officials and uh, finally the auditing process kind of caught up with him and then the whole story kind of rolled out. Uh, yet another conversation about what we ought to be doing with our state tax money for both the big grants, the kind that Dan Doyle got, and the little itty bitty grants out there, the kind that everybody gets and should stop asking for. In the meantime, on the national scene, this little uh, burp up by the vice president has some people talking. The headline here, you know, I guess Joe Biden has nothing to lose by suggesting he might go. Listen to this. Run again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to run in 2020. Um, so, uh, for what? But for president. <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, what the hell, man? <laughs> Anyway. We're going to run with that, sir, you know. Uh, you dropped that. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. No, but I, I've, I've enjoyed every minute of my time here in the Senate. Just to be clear, were you kidding about running for president in 2020? <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm not committing not to run. <laughs> I'm not committing to anything. I learned a long time ago. You know, I haven't seen, has, has Donald Trump tweeted about Joe Biden's uh, semi-loose lips on this? No. Jeez, uh, uh, Donald, where, where are you? Mr. President-elect, you're, you're late. I mean, how, how can you resist? Uh, I guess the price of the airplanes has got you really focused today. That's a semi-good thing. Anyway, Joe Biden is 74 years old, 78 in 2020. Uh, 78, uh, the old, is that, well, how's that going? Is 80 the new 40? I, I don't know how that goes one of those days, but stay tuned. Uh, he's angry, and of course, losing his son prevented him from getting into it this time around. Um, I think he's done a nice job regrouping, although you never regroup over that kind of a loss. We'll see. And then there's the conversation about never Trump. Uh, eventually, this will fade. Well, maybe not. It may grow. I'm not sure. Uh, let's take a look at the latest. 
in terms of uh, headline. Do we have headlines here? Or we just have a story? Yes, we have a story on Donald Trump's uh, latest, and then we'll meet our guest. In elect Donald Trump emerged from the elevators at Trump Towers, ready to cut government costs. Earlier, he tweeted, Boeing is building a brand new 747 Air Force One at a cost of more than $4 billion. Cancel order. I think Boeing is doing a little bit of a number. We want Boeing to make a lot of money, but not that much money. The Air Force awarded the contract to the U.S. aerospace company in January, citing obsolete parts in the current fleet and increased downtime. Two or more new planes would go into service around 2024. The original contract was for $3 billion, but costs are reportedly rising. Asked for comment, Boeing spokesman said, we're going to have to get back to you after we figure out what's going on. Mr. Trump's comments this morning continue his pattern of calling out U.S. companies. Over the weekend, he tweeted that companies that move operations out of the country will face a 35 percent tariff. But today on MSNBC's Morning Joe, Vice President-elect Mike Pence declined to endorse the plan. So are you for the 35 percent tariff? Well, let me go back to the intervening part. Are uh, you for the tariff, on, though? On the carrier thing. Well, I, I'm for us putting everything on the table in negotiations. The president-elect will leave Trump Tower this afternoon and head to Fayetteville, North Carolina for the next stop on his thank you tour. Traveling with him, Mr. Trump's pick for Secretary of Defense, retired General James Mattis. So uh, Tom Nichols is uh, no stranger to the broadcast. Uh, he's a professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. He speaks for himself, not the Naval War College. Thank and you. boy, did you speak for yourself this campaign season. Huh? Good I, to see you, my friend. I, thanks for having me back, Dan. Yes, I exercised my First Amendment rights to their fullest. You were, you were one of the <clears> leading <throat> never Trump, what do you, what, what, how should I say it? Um, antagonists, um, uh, you had a Twitter war going on during this entire campaign. Well, I, I wouldn't call it a war. I mean, I occupied a very strange space, which is you expected Democrats to oppose the Republican nominee. Uh, you expected Republicans to at least try and support the nominee. I was part of a small slice of Republicans who could not, in good conscience, support the nominee. And that, uh, I think, attracted an outsized attention because there were so few of us in that kind of twilight zone between the Democrats and the Republicans. And we were pretty outspoken. I was just one of many there. But um, I, I wrote a lot and made my opinion pretty clear about it and definitely heard, heard about it from the public. Yeah, no doubt. Um, uh, you've seen this. Sh you're watching the show at 7.30 and at midnight. Tom is also, uh, and we record early in the day, Tom's also kind enough to come over to the radio where I'm guessing... I'm previewing, but you may have heard him take a beating from, from some of the callers, something that I have experienced myself because I, too, I mean, Tom and I were um, semi-kindred spirits in this, in this whole thing. I am not a Republican. You're not a Republican anymore, or you were uh, at I, one point. I, I was. I left briefly. I came back. You did. <clears throat> where, where I go now is unclear. Yeah, well, well, defining what the parties are is kind of a difficult thing now, and I, and I want to be able to uh, discuss that a little bit later on in the program. It's almost like I don't even know where to start. What is your summary judgment as to what happened here? Well, there, the problem is you can't focus just on one side of the equation. People talk a lot about Trump's appeal. You also have to talk about Hillary Clinton's failure. Um, and, uh, of course, I promised to come back on your show before the election in case he won to explain what I think happened. One of the things that I made reference to back then was a possible black swan event, something you couldn't foresee coming. And I think there were actually two of them. I think there was the scare over Hillary Clinton's health, uh, one of the worst pieces of videotape I've ever seen during a campaign where she had to be into pulled van. into the van. Right. But the other was the Comey letter, was the James Comey intervention. Um, I, but I also think that Hillary Clinton was a weak candidate who ran a bad campaign. Um, the fact of the matter is, um, the president-elect has won with a very low percentage of the vote, uh, one of the lowest in electoral history. Um, he's going to win the Electoral College, and I would remind people that the Electoral College is the only thing that matters. Uh, but he'll win the Electoral College while losing a popular vote margin that's pretty sizable. So it's kind of a fluke election all around. Um, and I'll add one other thing about the pollsters, because, of course, this is being a political scientist. People ask me about the polls all the time. I think the pollsters mostly got his vote right. What they didn't get right was the, <clears throat> excuse me, the collapse in support in her vote, which came in much lower 
uh, than certainly she or anybody else expected. So that's not that's not how it's been spun. And there's a lot of self-effacing activity going on right now amongst the media, which has its kind of, you know, big uh, cyclical responses. I mean, the horror show that was election night, as, as their faces turned <laughs> a white, white and whiter, <laughs> right? Um, and, it, you know, as a member of the media, I can't deny that I, too, was like, oh, my gosh. But those who were live that night on the networks, you know, pretty much... You know, left it. You know, they experienced it on their sleeve for everybody. Yet now they're doing a lot of introspective. Holy cow! We missed the pulse of the Trump vote out there. You're suggesting no, it wasn't missed. Well, it some of it was. It, it, uh, yeah. I think the pollsters. One place the pollsters were wrong. Where um, and there were there were canaries in the coal mine. My friend Selena Zito, who writes at the the New York Post. She was doing dispatches from Pennsylvania saying, guys, there's something going on out here. You know, that Pennsylvania is not in the basket yet. Uh, it's, not, it's not a slam dunk for Clinton yet. Um, and she was hearing things, she and others who were out there on the ground. So we're, insofar as the pollsters got the Trump vote wrong, they weren't spending enough time among uneducated, non-urban white voters. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the big story, I think, was the collapse of um, the turnout on behalf of Hillary Clinton, because I think the Hillary Clinton turnout model was predicated on a lot more people coming out, not as many as for Barack Obama, um, but certainly more than came out. And I think that you, there's no way to put these two things together. Now, what Trump did, I think that was very clever, was realizing that he can't overcome the popularity of Democrats in the cities in places, let's say, like Pennsylvania, that Pennsylvania is always dominated by Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. What Trump did was stitch enough votes together in all of those red counties around those two blue cities. Most Republicans since 1988 have failed to do that. And they just seems, haven't been able to do uh, it. The Kellyanne Conways and Steve Bannons of the world, in fact, those two are probably most responsible for what seemed to be at least a strategic diligence at the end to find themselves in suburban and rural America. But right? I, I wouldn't give too much credit to them because, again, the, the Clinton machine left that wide open. You know, there were reports right after the election that Bill Clinton, right. who is, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, and I, I never voted for Bill Clinton, but I kind of admire his natural political gifts. I mean, he really is the, one of the most gifted politicians of our generation. He was saying things like, we got to go to Michigan, we got to go to Ohio, we have to talk to white working class voters. And the, the Clinton campaign was so certain that they had this in the, in the bag that they ignored a lot of those areas. Ke Kellyanne Conway did say one thing that I think is revealing and important. She said they were playing for 270, which is to say the electoral vote. The Clinton campaign was trying to grab kind of the biggest number of votes they could find without really thinking about the Electoral College because they thought they had that already put away. And that was a massive strategic mistake, in my view, by the Clinton campaign. All right, when we come back, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, well, there's so much to talk about, where the parties are, what the transition looks like, all of that. Stay with us. No dream is too big, no challenge is too great. Nothing we want for our future is beyond our reach. America will no longer settle for anything less than the best. That was his uh, election night winning speech. Uh, there are a lot of surprised people, aren't there? I think there were a lot of surprised people inside the Trump campaign. I firmly believe, even now, judging from the way the transition's being conducted, I don't think they expected to win. I think they were surprised. I think they probably figured sometime in the last week especially after the Comey business, uh, that things were starting to move their way. But I think they and everybody else were surprised. My, the, there were two moments where I suddenly realized that this was probably going to go the other way. I was um, speaking in Europe and talking about the election. I kept saying to people, oh, it's, don't worry, it's not going to happen. It's you know, totally unlikely. So I probably have to go back to a, on an apology tour in Europe. Um, but when I saw the, I was in Vienna and I saw the CNN International report the Comey business and I said, uh-oh, this is, this is bad. The other was on election day itself, the Clinton campaign said, uh, we're not going to do those fireworks later tonight. We're calling that off, um, you know, safety issues or something. And I said, oh, no, 
they've, they're getting early returns that are shocking them now. They're, they're figuring out that something bad is going to happen this evening and they're already pulling back the, the victory celebrations. And I think they, when they were getting the early returns, they knew. But I, but I think everybody was surprised and I think, I, I, until you know, I have reason to think otherwise, I think the Trump campaign was taken by surprise right up until the last minute as well. Well, it's one of those things where it, it, it's an impossible exercise to play in your mind. Um, trying to assess whether or not we should have known or we did know. There was, there was always something about the Clinton campaign with Comey, you know, with the DNC being raided by, by the WikiLeaks and the Russian thing. You just kind of felt like there was this, let's remember, uh, you know, I didn't vote for either one of them. There were a lot of people out there that were struggling, having to make a choice between really, really two terrible options in their minds. It, but, it, it, you know, on election day, I even felt a kind of, I don't know, I, he, he, he could pull he, it off, right? I don't know. He, my, I, I think don't the two, know. The two right? parties managed to pick the only two candidates who could possibly lose to each other. I mean, it was really remarkable that the primary process, Clinton captured the Democratic primary process two years ago. The Sanders challenge was never a real thing. That was never going to happen. And she and her machine sucked the oxygen out of the Democratic primary process early, which I think was unhealthy because it led to a lot of bad decision making in the Clinton campaign. Uh, the, the Republican primary process was this chaotic mess of 17 people, half of whom were running vanity campaigns that had no chance of succeeding. And in the end, we, we got this completely, I would say, freak accident result of the two most unpopular people in history running against each other. And I, I think it's not surprising that, again, you have somebody who's going to win the Electoral College, lose the popular vote, uh, but the, the, it sh the the only people that were surprised were the ones who were absolutely certain. You know, if you look at somebody like Nate Silver at the New York Times, he had it going into election day at 65-35. Well, if you're a gambler, that means that about three out of ten times you're going to lose if you're betting that way. So it wasn't impossible, and I think the people who thought it was impossible were the ones who were surprised. But that 65-35 was coming down from numbers like 80-20 and even 90-10 earlier on. So right. you know, anytime that kind of thing begins to right. shrink down, you wonder where's the elasticity and where's the momentum actually going, right? That, well, the t I th that's where I think the, um, I don't think she lost because of Comey. I think she, part of the reason she lost is because of who she is and her general public demeanor and fatigue of 25 years. But the Comey letter, I think, is the thing that stopped the momentum dead uh, and gave him, gave Trump the opening to, to start moving forward and to start pushing the needle in his direction. I think the people on the Trump side who are surprised are the people who thought he was going to win a smashing victory, win the popular vote, you know, this popular repudiation across the country. Uh, that didn't happen either. This was, this was a close run thing on both sides. And, I would argue, by the way, that the Electoral College functioned exactly the way it's supposed to function, which is that smaller states, rural states, can't simply be dictated to by New York and California. But it's still a pretty uncomfortable outcome for people that are trying to figure that out. And while it, is a, it was a difficult choice for so many people, there's no doubt that Trump activism superseded Clinton activism. And we'll talk about that when we come back. Stay mm -hmm. with us. It is important for all of us, regardless of party uh, and regardless of political preferences, uh, to now come together, work together, to deal with uh, the many challenges that we face. Uh, we want to do everything we can to help you succeed, because if you succeed, then the country succeeds. Please. Okay. Well, thank you very much, President Obama. Uh, this was a meeting that was going to last for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, we were just going to get to know each other. We had never met each other. Uh, I have great respect. Uh, the meeting lasted for almost an hour and a half, and it could have, as far as I'm concerned, it could, could have gone on for a lot longer. We really um, — we discussed a lot of different situations, some wonderful and some difficulties. Uh, you know, Tom, I, I, I got to say, I, I, I've said before, I think 
it might have been the worst day of Barack Obama's life, at least professionally and politically. And it might have been the most horrifying day of Donald Trump's life. And, and people will be upset for that suggestion, but I thought it was written all over their faces. I, I did too. Um, I think uh, this, w clearly if you're a Democrat and you supported Barack Obama, this is not how the script was supposed to end. This was supposed to end with him being able to hand off his legacy to a chosen successor, even somebody that he had once run against, that Democrats were going to pick up seats in the House and the Senate, that this was going to be you know, kind of the end of this period of Republican uh, hard right movement into government and a cementing of the president's legacy. I think for the president-elect, this was the first time that he'd really gotten a look behind closed doors. I would, I would give anything one day to know what the conversation was between them because that was one of the few times I think you saw Donald Trump look humbled and maybe a little scared because I think Barack Obama closed the door and said, this is what being president looks like and these are the things you're going to have to think about. And I, I think that the momentum of the campaign in, in the heat of the campaign and the changes in campaign staff and turnover, I don't think Donald Trump, my personal view is that Donald Trump had really never given a lot of thought to that. And I think when they were finally alone in the White House, uh, that, that was probably a bad day for both of them. Yes. So to the point prior to the break, though, the one thing we have to remember in the midst of this election uh, and respect, and that is that those who wanted to see Donald Trump elected wanted to see Donald Trump elected. Uh, and those who wanted to see Hillary Clinton elected, uh, I'm sure there's some equal, you know, uh, emotion and, and you, know, uh, you know, mission. But for the most part, the numbers in terms of activist voters far outweighed for the Donald The enthusiasm Trump. gap sure. was huge. Uh, although I will say that uh, President Obama, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, all have pretty dedicated cults of personality among their most committed supporters. But yes, the people who wanted to see Trump elected felt fervently about it, much more so, I think, than the people, uh, at least most of the people who were behind Hillary Clinton who were kind of dragging themselves through and saying, well, it's her turn, it's time, we have to do this, uh, it's necessary to stop Donald Trump, uh, and, and so on. And so I, I think that did make a, a significant difference between them, absolutely. Uh Tom is good enough to stay for tomorrow night's show. He doesn't have to pack a bag uh, due to some scheduling issues. We're actually recording two shows. Give me a cliff note, though, on what you think this transition looks like. We'll talk about that on the Wednesday program, but what do you think about this transition right now? We haven't seen a real transition in, since 2008. And so for a lot of people, this is their first time seeing it. So it looks messy, and I think it is messier than previous transitions because I think a lot of this is being done on the fly. Uh, and I think the, the, if you want a cliff note for what I think is happening, the problem is people who are qualified for the jobs and people who were loyal to Donald Trump are not always the same people. And trying to f find the kind of overlap of that diagram where you have people who are competent, people who are loyalists, it's a very thin pool and they're trying to find their way through it. And I think the, uh, the symbol of that is the struggle over the Secretary of State's choice. So very we'll much. Talk, we'll talk about that on the Tomorrow Night Show. Final word and we come back. Stay with us. Professor Tom Nichols will join us on the Tomorrow program as well, some scheduling issues, and uh, there's never enough time to talk to Tom based on uh, his expertise and his perspective, no doubt. So when we reconvene tomorrow, we'll talk about the transition, and we'll talk about his latest book coming out, which would be a great Christmas gift, which is called The Death of Expertise. And for those of you who are know-it-alls, you should tune in for that. See you on the radio tomorrow at 3 on WPRO. Thanks for watching.